<laughs> so, so Martha White is the manager of E.B. White's literary, literary estate and the editor of several compilations of his works, including On Democracy and Letters of E.B. White. Martha is also a freelance writer who has contributed work to Yankee Publishing, The New York Times, The Boston Globe, and The Old Farmer's Almanac. She currently lives in Rockport, Maine with her husband where they run the Rockport Marine. Okay, and now I'm handing it over to you. All right. Well, thank you all. I can't see any of you. It's totally unfair. You can see me, but I can't see you. So uh, you have the advantage here. But thank you for coming. I assume you're out there. Uh, I always think when when I do a, an event to do with my grandfather, people ask, you know, the granddaughter of E.B. White to come and speak. And I always think people are going to expect a six-year-old to show up. <laughs> because, you know, of course, mo most of my days with my grandfather where uh, when I was quite young he he uh, he he was 55 when I was born I was born in 1954 I'll tell you I'm 66 years old now I'm not six anymore uh, uh, so he, he I knew him essentially for the for the first 30 years of my life and for the last 30 years of his life he, he died in 1985 uh, when he was 86 uh, so I, I was just coming into uh, being a writer and editor myself. I, I actually worked on the staff of, of Yankee Magazine and the Old Farmer's Almanac in, in Dublin uh, for 17 years or something like that and, and uh, kept doing it freelance for a while after that while I was also freelancing for other publications. Um, so he, you know, he knew, he knew I was an English major. He knew I was uh, headed in that direction. He was all encouragement and and uh, so was my grandmother who was an editor herself at the at the new yorker uh but he didn't uh live to see a great deal of my working life unfortunately um so ba basically i knew my grandfather uh, the way probably many of you knew your grandparents which was uh he was the guy that would introduce us to the to the shore and the barn and the goings on in the barnyard uh when when uh we uh, grew up, we, we lived probably five miles away from him, so my brothers and I could ride our bicycles over there and, and you know, help out in the, in the barn uh, with the animals or, or in the gardens in the summer, and, uh, you know, we'd go and swim on his shore or, or do an occasional overnight there uh, if my mother was having my younger brother, for instance, <laughs> or things like that. Uh, we, you know, we knew they had offices downstairs in the in the house, and but we mostly weren't there when they were working. We were there when they weren't working, uh, so we knew them as grandparents, uh, which I've always felt was a very fortunate thing for me to to really grow up uh, with that. And and you know, he was not a, a writer who ever wanted celebrity. He avoided all of that, and he avoided public speaking of all kinds. And and uh, they rarely had uh, writers and editors to the house. When I knew them, they they you know they had lived for many years in New York when they were both working on the New Yorker. But by the time I knew them, uh, they were in Maine full time. Uh, they had moved to Maine in the in the nineteen thirties, um, but in the forties and fifties, they kept going back and forth between Maine and New and, and New York. Uh, particularly during the war years, they, they went back uh, for several years uh, when the war was going on because the New Yorker needed staff. Um, so, so they were in New York then. But, but by the time I was in Maine, uh, they were there full time and, and to, to my and my brother's great advantage. Um, so when, when my grandfather died in, in 1985, uh, at first my father for a few years was the executor doing the permissions and uh, giving permissions for the translations and so forth for the ch children's books particularly have been translated into something like 36 languages and that's still happening. We just uh, the other day got a permission for an Armenian translation of Charlotte's Web. So there's still uh, activity on that front and, and certainly the essays and books are still being uh, published and reprinted and so forth. Uh, so, and uh, right now, Sesame Workshop is is uh, in negotiations about a Charlotte's Web uh, venture that they want to do. And that, you know, there's actually quite a lot going on in the E.B. White literary world. Uh, but my my father did it for a few years, which really meant that my mother 
uh, did it because she was the one in the office. My father was running the boatyard at the time. My brother now uh, runs Brooklyn Boatyard, but my father started it and was running it in the uh, 80s still. And uh, so my mother uh, did the permissions work for a period of time. And then probably about 20 years ago, she said to me, you know, you're, you're in the office all the time. You're dealing with agents and editors. You do this. Uh, so, so I took it on um, somewhere around 2000, 2001. Um, and at that time, the, the first letters book, the E.B. White, um, the letters of E.B. White that Dottie Guth, who was his goddaughter, this letters book had just gone out of print. So I took it on myself to go to Cornell, in, into the archives there, his manuscripts and letters and so forth are all at Cornell because that's where he went. And um, the first book had been published, um, I think it was 1976. So it was about 10 years before he died. And so we got the idea of uh, putting the final 10 years uh, in it, you know, choosing letters from that 10 year period to put in it and, and taking out some of the things that seem more dated and, and making a revised edition of the book. So we, we did that, did the new revised edition of Letters of E.B. White. Uh, and that, for me, was a great way to sort of get into the archives, read everything that he'd written, uh, you know, really think about how to uh, best represent his work and, you know, get to know Cornell and the library there, the, the manuscript library. Uh, and that led to uh, a second book because Cornell University Press uh, asked me if I would do a book of quotations, of E.B. White quotations. And so I chose, yes, I would do that. And we put out uh, In the Words of E.B. White. They were, they were wanting to do a series of books by various authors and they wanted to include E.B. White. And at, at first I thought, well, you know, my, my uncle, Roger Angel, he's a, a writer as well, would probably be some of you know him as a baseball writer, but he's also written some other great essays and pieces. Uh, Roger called it E.B. White Light because it was, you know, the quotations. Uh, but the reason I chose to do it for Cornell University Press was there were so many quotations attributed to him on the internet uh, that weren't his words or writings, uh, and also many quotations that were on the internet that were inaccurate. They were, they were badly recorded or, or inaccurately recorded. So it seemed to me a, a, an opportunity to correct some of that. So, so I chose to do that. And it, it also seemed to me that for people who'd grown up maybe knowing only the children's books, uh, you know, Charlotte's Web and Stuart Little and Trumpet of the Swan, that, that maybe the quotations book would be an opportunity for them to realize that, you know, this writer that they knew as the children's writer had also done some pretty remarkable uh, uh, adult essays and so forth for the New Yorker uh, that they might have missed. So, so we put that together. And then uh, the quotations book uh, was done, we basically compiled it alphabetically by subject matter. And so when we came to the uh, subject of dogs, there were so many great quotations about dogs that I couldn't choose which ones to put in. So I put them all in a manila folder and I thought, well, I'll just, you know, when I'm, when I'm at the end and I've got this folder, I'll just pick out the best ones and put it in the quotations book. Uh, which I did, but uh, then I also realized after the fact that there was another whole book just about dogs. And as a dog lover myself, and my grandfather certainly was a dog lover, uh, it just seemed like a fun thing to do. And also another really good way of, of maybe bridging that gap between the children's books and the adult books. So we put out E.B. White on dogs. And uh, for that one, I chose a, a main publisher, Tilbury House Press, uh, which at the time was being uh, edited by Jennifer Bunting, who had the advantage of not only being a dog lover herself and having a dog in her office, <laughs> which was in Gardner, Maine at that point, uh, but that she had also worked for my grandfather as what we called Sunday help. She would go over on the weekend and, and help uh, catch up on the correspondence and uh, you know, typing that needed to be done. So she knew my grandfather and she knew his dogs. She, she uh, knew what the, the scene was like. And, and that was a really fun project was to, to put together E.B. White on dogs. 
and that that was very successful and and also had kind of the side bonus of uh of really raising quite a lot of awareness and money for some of the uh pet rescue operations that uh you know try to relocate dogs that uh, need a home for one reason or another and and so not only were we doing um, book signings and tours with the, the libraries and bookstores, but also with some of the uh, rescue shelters and things like that. And so that that um, was great. And my grandfather would have loved that because his dogs were all mutts and mongrels and uh, neurotic rescues of one kind or another, as if you've read any of the dog essays or read about Fred and in many of his essays about the dachshunds, uh, you'll know. Uh, and so at the end of E.B. White on Dogs, I thought, all right, I'm really done now. <laughs> I want to uh, go back to doing my own freelancing and, and uh, stop, you know, stop being the advocate for E.B. White. Uh, but then along came the 2016 um, elections. And suddenly I was writing letters to the editor quite frequently uh, and often quoting my grandfather on subjects uh, about you know, nationalism or fascism or freedom of speech or uh, some of the many um, recurring events of history. <laughs> he'd been he'd been writing a lot about those subjects in the 30s and 40s and 50s, and suddenly we were all talking about them again and and what nationalism meant as opposed to uh, thinking of our world as a more uh, boundary less uh, global environment that we're all in. Uh, so after talking uh, with Harper, uh, Harper Collins publishers, again, we decided to put out E.B. White on Democracy, which is the fourth compilation and I think the final compilation uh, that I plan to do uh, with the E.B. White stuff. Uh, that one has not been as popular as the dog book, I'm sorry to say, uh, but it has uh, recently been uh, picked up for publication in China, which is interesting to me. Um, it's not being called E.B. White on democracy in China, it's being called uh, E.B. White on hope, which I think is interesting. Um, historically, the, the title comes from one of the letters, uh, an essay letter uh, that was uh, to a man named Mr. Nado. It was uh, Mr. Nado had written my grandfather during the Vietnam War and asked him essentially, you know, how do you keep your hope up in a time of such discouragement? And my grandfather answered with a beautiful letter in 1973 that we call On Hope. And it's been um, probably the most frequently reprinted essay or letter uh, in the last few years because uh, so many people today, I think, are discouraged about what's going on uh, politically in our, in our country. Uh, but it's a very uplifting uh, letter about uh, winding the clock and uh, not losing hope and uh, the value of one compassionate man or woman uh, doing a little something. So that's the E.B. White on democracy. Um, I'm not keeping track of time. Maybe maybe you want to tell me whether you'd prefer to go straight to questions at this point or you'd like to... Uh, you still have, have some time um, if okay. you want to keep so, going, if like, there's some more memories you want to share. Sure. I'll, t I'll talk then a, a little more about um, just memories as, as a granddaughter. Um, I, I, you know, sitting in this office that so you probably can see the bookshelves behind me, which are full of family photos and books, some of which were my grandfather's, but, but uh, I've been sort of fortunate to accumulate lots of odds and ends uh, that were in either his office or home. And, and I'll show you some of those. One is a little scow, a little model of a, of a boat that he built from the plans uh, that were published in the American Boys Handybook, if any of you know that, uh, is still available today. Uh, he built a little scow for my father in 1940 when my father was about 10, uh, it, it called Flounder because it's a flat bottom scow and painted gray. And uh, so that's one of the things in my office. I also have, uh, I don't know if you can see it, there's a there's a goose egg that Melissa Sweet gave me when she was working on the children's biography of, of E.B. White. Uh, there's Blackwing pencils, which are the pencil of choice of editors and writers because uh, they used to have a, the original ones that my grandparents had, had a motto on them that, that read, um, half the pressure, twice the speed, because it's a soft lead pencil and easy to 
hold all day while you're editing and, and so I have you know black one pencils so so my office is still littered with all these things that sort of you know are from my childhood and from his house um, there's a photo of this is Fern the the little boat that my grandfather had it was an Augie Nielsen sloop that he named Fern because he he bought it he commissioned her to be built for him with the money that came uh, when Charlotte's Web turned out to be successful. He, he, he didn't think that was gonna happen. He thought uh, it, it wasn't gonna be successful at all. Actually, he thought none of his children's books were gonna be particularly successful. Of course, they all were. Um, so we have you know, lots of odds and ends like that. Um, but I think, I think I was telling you, uh, you know, that the grandfather I knew really, you know, now I have all this stuff that was from the office and to do with, you know, his writing and so forth. I mean, this, my, my computer right now is propped on an old uh, uh, typewriter stand of his, which was the typewriter he would take down to the shore and, and use in the, in the boathouse when he would uh, try to get away from the confusion or noise of the house and go, go work in the boathouse for, for a nice day in the summer. Uh, so there's, you know, odds and ends like that. But the, the, the grandfather that I knew uh, was, the, was the guy who, you know, in the middle of the winter when I was over there, you know, and decided that Greeno, the, the inflatable frog that he had given me for swimming uh, on the shore with, Greeno was stored in the boat shed for the winter and I decided it was an emergency. We needed to go rescue Greeno from the, from the boat shed and bring it up to the house. And so we trudged through the snow and ice down a very long road to the shore, uh, you know, chipped the ice away from the boathouse door and rescued Greeno, brought her back to the house and blew, her, blew it up and, you know, had my inflatable toy in, in the house. And it, to, to my knowledge, you know, at the age of six or seven or whatever I was then, you know, that emergency seemed just as real to him as it did to me. He was perfectly willing to go, you know, rescue Greeno. And, and I think he was the guy, you know, he always kept that sense of kind of wonder and amusement and appreciation of the natural world and, and life and, and certainly grandchildren or young people in general. I mean, he, he, he was the guy that, uh, you know, children just gravitated toward him because he didn't talk down to a child. He didn't uh, think you were, you know, not smart enough or not polite enough. He, you know, he was uh, thrilled to hang out with a child and show, show us, you know, the, 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 spring pullet egg the first egg of the season you know would be brought into the living room and put in a little black bowl so that everybody could see the, the tiny first eggs or you know take us out to the to the barn when there were new lambs cavorting around or or um you know skating on the pond he had a heart-shaped uh, skating pond that we would enjoy with him you know that kind of thing when, when we were there uh, with them uh, we were outdoors with him we were on the couch reading books with my grandmother. People always say, oh, did your grandfather read you books? No, <laughs> my grandmother read the books. You know, we, with my grandfather, we were, we were outside. Uh, and, and like I said, you know, when we were there, they weren't working. They were uh, spending time with us. And it might be doing chores, uh, you know, uh, deadheading the, the flower border with my grandmother or, or helping with the wood pile or, the hang season or something like that but but uh you know w w we were there when they could spend time with us and really my awareness of my grandfather uh, or either of my grandparents being writers and editors didn't it, it you know it wasn't that i didn't know that they were but uh it didn't seem to take up much time <laughs> in my experience and and really i was in high school before I realized that other people knew who he was or uh, had read his books. I mean, I, I thought, you know, he was doing some office work for the New Yorker, but I, I had no idea that um, he was known far and wide for the children's books, for instance, until I went away to school. And uh, but my older brother and I had both gone to a, a prep school in, in Massachusetts for high school because the, the little school in our town closed down <laughs> just as we would have headed in that direction. There, there, there were too few students in town at that point to keep the school going. So, so uh, we were sent off to prep school. And, and when I left, my grandfather sent me with a copy of The Elements of Style and he inscribed it uh, 
uh, and you can use all the needless words you want to. Uh, and, you know, th that was when I began to understand that uh, other people uh, knew who he was. And, and when my teachers or a classmate would get a little too breathy and say, oh, you know, what was your grandfather like? You know, I, I, I would, I mean, I was proud of him, but I was also kind of a, a little annoyed by that. And I'd say, well, you know, he was my grandfather. What was your grandfather like? Because <laughs> uh, I think I didn't really understand the extent to which uh, his name was known. Uh, and, and I've always thought that that was a fortunate thing. You know, he, he didn't care about that. And, and uh, we had the advantage of growing up with a guy who really, um, you know, was just our grandfather. <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave it at that and, and turn it up back to you. And I'm happy to share many, many more memories if, if you've got questions. Okay, perfect. Um, so if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask, you are more than welcome to um, to put them in the, the chat. I just saw a bunch of people drop off and I know we're getting thunder here. So I'm, I'm thinking oh dear. <laughs> people accidentally got kicked off because it was like, it was like five people at a time. And we're like, uh oh, someone lost. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box and we'll certainly ask um, Martha about them. Um, I guess we can start with, I mean, you pr you're probably asked this a lot, but what is your favorite, um, I guess I'll ask your favorite writing, because that could be an essay, or and your favorite children's book that your, your grandfather wrote? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think that I have many favorites. I mean, that letter to Mr. Nado on Hope is certainly one of them. Uh, and and very current right now. Uh, there there are two other essays that he actually wrote uh, it, when they were in Sarasota when when they got uh, to be older and their health, particularly my grandmother's health, was was failing. They started to go to Sarasota, Florida, in the winter, um, uh, which was a big change for both of them. They you know my grandfather was was born in Mount Vernon, New York, but my grandmother was a New Englander. Uh, and being there for Christmas particularly was was difficult for for them both, um, but you know easier on their health and and we would go down once in a while. But my grandfather, uh, particularly, he liked to visit the the Ringling Brothers Circus, and and in that, those days you could go and watch the practice sessions at at the circus. You go early in the morning when the tents were cool, and and the the acts would be doing their practice sessions and. And there was one um, where he was watching a young woman on a horse going around the ring. She was standing on the back of the horse. And first it was the mother leading the, the horse around the ring. And then her daughter comes and gets on the back of the horse and, you know, is a teenager and, and has her own act. And, and he's watching that. And he wrote an essay about it called The Ring of Time. And it's just a fabulous piece about... It kind of like once more to the lake, it, it, it's about uh, the ring of time. It's about time repeating over the generations and, and that observation of the young woman on the horse and, and the beauty of it and just the repetition and timelessness of it. And um, that, that essay to me uh, has the kind of emotion and observation and keen uh, sense of wonder that just speaks to me about who my grandfather was and, and uh, really comes home to me in a personal way. And there's another Sarasota essay called What Do Our Hearts Treasure, um, which was about my mother putting together a package with a balsam wreath for their you know Christmas uh, and some homemade uh, ornaments that we kids had made and, and some school photos of the grandchildren uh, and sending that off and, and it, you know, it, it, it's about uh, suddenly Christmas seemed possible in Sarasota to my grandmother and the smell of balsam and the, and the funny photo of my, my grandfather wrote something about my younger brother John was uh, holding his face in a way that uh, was meant to defy the photographer and he looked just like Jimmy Hoffa. And, you know, when I read that many years later as an adult, I, I immediately, I knew exactly which photo he meant, you know, the photo of my brother John really did look like Jimmy Hoffa. And, 
you know, that smell of balsam and that I remember making the little uh, paper drums with the Q-tip batons, uh, you know, he, he had that ability to really take a small moment, a, a, a keen observation and put it on paper and, and speak to it in a way that really resonated. And uh, that's, that's a favorite. Uh, as far as the children's books, you know, everybody always says Charlotte's Web is their favorite. For me, it was always Stuart Little, and, and it was really because Stuart was small, and he was a skater, and a swimmer, and a sailor, it, you know, it, to me, that, that was everything, and plus I knew, you know, it, it, I, I knew that the, the goose and the pig on the farm ended up on our dinner tables, and not at the Blue Hill Fair. <laughs> I was kind of a realist. Uh, I knew the animals weren't speaking, and, and uh, uh, the bacon wouldn't be saved. My, I had a cousin uh, many years after that Charlotte's Web was published, she, she tried to save a pig on the farm by uh, making a drawing of the web and some pig and so forth. And uh, her, her attempts, her, her activism was not rewarded. <laughs> the pig still went to the table. Thank you so much for answering that question. Um, I'm going to have to, I feel like I need to read all these essays that you're mentioning now. It's very, very interesting. Very exciting. Yeah, his so essays, I mean, excuse me, his, his, the, 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 the one man's meat collection uh, of essays uh, was, in my view, really some of his best writing. And some, some of those uh, are, are in it, I think. Um, one man's meat and essays of B.B. White are the ones I would look to first. But the, the one man's meat ones are the early years when they were moving to Maine and, and getting the farm going. And, and really some of those essays are among the best of all, I think. Great, thank you. Um, I do have a question from Kelly. Um, she is wondering um, if your grandfather influenced you in any way to pursue a literary career early on, or is that something you grew into on your own? If so, what memories of his guidance do you have? <laughs> uh, I, I would say I grew into it on my own. It, ma mainly I say that because I was so unaware <laughs> of their literary careers until after I had already uh, declared myself as an English major. Um, I, I really, for me, it, I mean, I think I, I would ascribe my love of reading both to my grandmother and to my mother. They were both avid readers. My grandfather was not an avid reader, uh, but I was like, like my mother and my grandmother. And, and all I wanted to do was read books. And I figured anything that could keep me reading books <laughs> was going to be good. So I was an English major and, and, uh, you know, had the idea that I would write books, uh, but really my, my career has been more to do with uh, editing and, and essays than it has books, although I have, I have done some books. Um, so I, I wouldn't ascribe it to him or say that he was pushing me in that direction. I mean, he, he, even for my father, you know, who ended up being a boat builder of his own volition, uh, you know, I don't think my father ever felt that he was maybe expected or, or hoped to go in a different direction, you know, a literary direction. He turned out to be able to write very beautifully about boats, but I don't think he ever felt that he should have uh, been primarily a writer. And I, and I think my grandfather, you know, he would say to any writer, you know, <laughs> you only want to go down that road if you, if you really have to, because it's such a difficult uh, path, uh, you know, both to keep your, uh, to keep sitting in the chair all day, uh, and, and then to try to get things published, it, you know, it's not an e easy path. Um, he, he was aware that I was headed in that direction, you know, by the time I got out of college, it was clear that's what I was going to do. And there was one instance where he wrote a letter on my behalf, I think it was to Country Journal magazine, which is now not, no longer in existence, but at the time they were still going and, and he kind of gently inquired whether there might be a position on the staff for me at Country Journal, which, which uh, at the time they weren't hiring, and so there wasn't. Uh, but despite that, I you know, made my way on my own into other uh, literary ventures and ended up at Yankee Magazine, which wasn't all that different, uh, but without uh, assistance from him. Uh, so I think he, you know, if he had lived to see more of it, I think he would have been supportive and, and happy about it, but I certainly wouldn't have taken credit for it. Ah, 
got to remember to unmute myself. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, just because I've noticed people are popping back on, I'm assuming some people lost power and just gained it back. So um, just letting you know that we are um, now in the, in the process of asking Martha any questions um, you would like, you can put it in the chat. So if you have any questions, feel free to send it to us and we'll ask her. Um, so John actually has a few questions for you. So I'll start with the first one. Um, he asked, how do you balance um, E.B. White's, your grandfather's celebrity and his reluctance to be celebrated? How do you think he would have responded to our last administration? <laughs> well, read, read E.B. White on democracy and you'll know all about that <laughs> as far as how he responded uh, to the last administration. Uh, you know, I, I really do think it's in there. I mean, it's amazing how history repeats itself uh, and all the things that we're talking about today, he was writing about in the 30s and 40s and 50s. So just pick up the book. You can read about presidents who golf. You can read about nationalism. You can read about fascism. You can read about, um, you know, newspapers and conglomerates, uh, you know, uh, freedom of the press, all, all, it's all right there. It's, it's remarkable. Uh, I'm trying to remember the beginning part of this question, uh, the celebrity and celebration. Uh, he was very successful in not allowing himself to be a celebrity. And, and he you know, quietly made the a point of view known that he didn't think writers should have to be a celebrity. Uh, you know, they were inroads to that in terms of his time, you know, as interviewers tried to come and talk to him on his 70th and 80th birthdays, for instance. Uh, he, sometimes he would leave Maine. I mean, he, he once recruited me to come drive him to Vermont on his birthday because <laughs> he knew there'd be interviewers showing up and he'd want to be there. Uh, he, you know, he, it wasn't just that... Uh, that he didn't think he should have to be a celebrity. It was also that he really physically couldn't do it. I mean, he, he was not able to stand up and, and do public speeches by any means. He, even accepting an award was just um, grueling for him. He tried it a couple of times and then he stopped uh, because it, you know, it just would make him get a nervous stomach and he'd be a wreck and he wouldn't be able to get any work done. And, you know, he just didn't like it and wouldn't do it. Um, so how I balance that, um, is that one, you know, he left very specific instructions about what he did and did not want to do. Um, you know, for instance, he did not want his house to become a museum and there have been attempts in that uh, direction, uh, which so far, fortunately, uh, have not come to fruition. Um, he, he, you know, tr tried very hard not to allow his works to be associated with commercial ventures. So, for instance, when we give permissions uh, for some of the dramatic rights that, that he did want us to allow, uh, but he knew, you know, that uh, they quickly morph into something different than what he wrote, certainly. Uh, the, the dramatic and movie rights uh, uh, become their own thing, which he knew they would. Uh, but he was very careful, for instance, to um, have us try to the greatest extent possible to do them without advertising. So, for instance, we don't say... Uh, Charlotte's Web movie brought to you by, um, you know, Seagram Seven or or Tide Detergent or something like that. He 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 really believed in there being a separation between creative rights and commercial ventures, and we've tried very hard to to keep that line. Uh, so it you know it's not always easy, and we say no to quite a lot of things. Uh, as a result, um, I think. It really on balance it's it's been to the good um, in some ways sometimes I think it makes his work more uh, desirable to people which is interesting rather than less so okay, um, so another question for, from John is do you think his amazing essays and adult writing is as appreciated today as it was in the past 
Uh, I think when people read it, they appreciate it. I think it's less known today. You know, a lot of his um, early essays and New Yorker writings, uh, while they're, you know, you can still find them. You know, some of them you'd really have to search for. Some, some of the early books have gone out of print and we've allowed that. Uh, some of them, the uh, more recent books, you know, have reprinted. Uh, for instance, the essays book has essays in it that were in some of the earlier books that have now gone out of print. So they are still mostly available. The best of them and the least dated of them are still available. But I think, I think you know, clearly more and more people today know him for the children's books rather than uh, the adult writing, which I think is unfortunate because I think a lot of his adult writing is still very current. <laughs> What do you think it is about the children's books that have, um, you know, they've become so cherished over the, the decades. So what do you think it is about his children's books that have um, lasted the test of time? Yeah, that's a great question. And a lot of people have tried to answer it. Uh, you know, my own personal answer is that he doesn't talk down to children. You know, he wrote the books, um, you know, you, any parent reading them, for instance, uh, is also appreciating the way they're written because uh, not only do they not talk down to children, but there's something in there for the parents to appreciate on an adult level. You know, there's often, uh, I, I mean, for instance, I was, I was interested to see when I was putting together E.B. White on Democracy that all three ch children's books have... Uh, lines in them about freedom and democracy. And, you know, as an example, when Stuart Little goes into the schoolroom and is being substitute teacher for the day, uh, you know, he and the and Stuart and the school children are talking about uh, what it would mean to be king of the world. And, and he's really talking about a world governance. He's talking about, you know, what it would be like uh, if everybody lived under the same you know, rights and privileges in the world. Uh, but, you know, it's written for a child and a child doesn't feel, they don't feel talked down to, but they probably also aren't really catching all of that language about freedom and democracy. And, and each of the three books is, is that way. I mean, Charlotte's Web, you know, when, when um, Wil Wilbur the pig escapes from his pen and, uh, starts running around as an escapee and the goose is yelling, you know, go left, go right, or do this, do that. Uh, you know, he's experiencing freedom and liberty, you know, <laughs> and has to make a choice of, you know, does he want that or does he want to come back to the slop bucket? And, uh, you know, there's, there's some food for thought in there for, for adults. And so I think, you know, I, I think they're written in such a way that, they appeal to children and to adults alike. Adults like to keep reading them and want to read them again, uh, you know, as adults to their children. And, and uh, I think the, the things that they're written about are timeless enough. You know, they're not fads. They're not, uh, not writing about cell phones or things that, you know, go out of style. Uh, you know, it's life on a farm or, or you know, a travel in search of a beloved, you know, it's, it's things that um, carry with time. Okay. Um, and John's last question so far um, is, um, unless you have more, John, we're welcome. We're <laughs> so happy to have any questions. So again, if anyone has questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll ask them. Um, so um, John's last question was, um, could you talk a little about your grandfather's relationship with your father? Sure. Um, so my father was my grandfather's only child. My 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 grandparents, um, you know, were were married. And my my grandmother had been married before, so she had two children from her first marriage, Roger and Nancy uh, Angel, and um, but they were much older than my father. And while they spent time in the household, they they were mostly. Uh, gone off to school by the time my my father was growing up. So my father was his father's first and only child, uh, and he was also pretty much the only one um, 
at home uh, going to the local schools in Maine, um, you know, growing up on the farm. Uh, Nancy and Roger were, were half the time with their dad and, and a lot of the time off at school. Um, so my father and his father were certainly very close. And, and my, my father, I think, is the part of the reason that my grandfather insisted on moving from New York to Maine because he really wanted my father to grow up uh, in, in the country and, and footloose and fancy free, not, not, um, not going to the piano lesson in the city. <laughs> uh, and he convinced my grandmother that he could teach my father as much piano as my father might need to know, which wasn't very much. <laughs> uh, so, and, and, you know, I think my father had the advantage of um, enjoying his father's love of getting to getting on the farm, getting out into the, you know, woodworking shop, making a flat bottom scow for a boy uh, from the American Boys Handy Book or making a wheelbarrow. You know, he, he built us wheelbarrows when we were kids that were small ch child's wheelbarrows. And, you know, my father would have seen his father at work in the wood, wood shop and, and, you know, realize how much joy that gave him and also the skills uh, imparted to do that. And my, my father grew up uh, loving boats uh, because my grandfather loved boats and would take him sailing and allowed him to be in a small uh, hair shop uh, uh, when he was you know, a teenager and could go off overnight, you know, in a small boat climbing under the cockpit. Um, so, you know, I think all of that fed into my father's uh, love of boats and, and interest in naval architecture and uh, wanting to become a boat builder and, and return to Maine. He just loved all of that stuff. And my grandfather was very supportive of all of that. I, I think both he and my grandmother worried a little bit about <laughs> how Joel was going to be able to make a living at it. Uh, especially early on when there weren't many yachts being built in this, this little town. Um, and, and, you know, my father built uh, fiberglass lobster boats for a while and also did some lobstering on the side to make ends meet. Uh, but I, I don't think my grandfather, uh, you know, I don't think he tried to push my father to do something else. Uh, and when my grand, when my father wanted to leave Cornell after two years and go to MIT because he could get a naval architecture degree there, that made sense, you know, even though Cornell was my grandfather's uh, school. So, uh, you know, I think my, my grandfather uh, respected the child in my father and respected uh, the emerging adult and, and knew enough to let him uh, have his have his head, as he would say in the livestock world, um, and I, and I think my my father always respected and loved his father for that, for allowing that. And you know, my my grandmother was a little more of a worrier. She probably pushed a little harder for the book learning and the uh, alternative possibilities to boat building. And um, I think my my grandfather was able to, you know, talk her down <laughs> and say he's going to be just fine. And of course he was. And, and so I think my, my father had a, a very close uh, relationship with them both, uh, but was probably more like his father in, in um, temperament and, and uh, uh, just joy of uh, the outdoors and that sort of thing. Okay. I think I, um, so I guess we're going to start wrapping it up. So if anyone has any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat. But um, if you want to say a little few last words on your grandfather and maybe like when people read his stuff, what do you think, what do you hope they are getting from his writing? And is what do you hope like the lessons are that they're learning from reading your grandfather, whether it's the children's books or the essays, like what do you hope that he's instilling in people? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I don't think he was ever trying to instill anything. <laughs> uh, but I think he did, of course. Uh, uh, and I think really what, what I hope people get still uh, is, is just that 
you know, his incredible ability to, to retain that sense of wonder that, that children have, and, and, but very few people are able to hang on to as, as we become adults, you know, we get busy with other things and you sort of forget to uh, see the natural world around you and take joy in it. And, and, and the same, you know, often when you have children or grandchildren particularly, you know, sometimes the children bring you back to that, it, it remind you to, you know, look at the, you know, the insects in the grass or the, uh, what's going on in the barnyard or the wonder of an egg or those kinds of things. I mean, he had the ability to, to hold all of that. And I think his aim was always to, um, you know, to transmit that, and to record it and, and relay it in, in a way that would, if anything, you know, if he was trying to do anything uh, uh, as far as persuasion, I would say, you know, it would have to do with cherishing those things and and trying our best to preserve them you know care caretake them caretake the natural world he was a big um fan of rachel carson for instance and and that's very telling you know he he worried about uh, the natural world and what we're doing to it but and, and thought you know mankind had uh wreaked a lot of havoc uh so i i think certainly you know hanging on to that love of of the natural world would be a big one. Uh, and then I, you know, I would just encourage people to, to uh, go back into the adult essays and, uh, you know, particularly One Man's Meat, if you're looking for the local New England uh, flair, uh, or, or, you know, E.B. White on democracy, if you're interested in, in his take on the political situation today, because really it's all the same material, it's all the same subjects uh, come round again. Uh, we're in a kind of a tough spot right now with nobody really listening to the, to each other. <laughs> he might encourage that to happen more often. But he was, you know, in his writing, he was uh, always careful. He would say, you know, I'm a member of a party of one. Uh, you know, he didn't he didn't uh, choose sides and try to push a political point of view. Uh, he he tried to find what he thought was right for the world and for the people in it. So. Well, thank you so much, Martha, for taking time out of your evening to be with us tonight and to talk about um, not only your grandfather, but but how you're, um, you are doing such a fabulous job, like sharing his legacy and keeping it going and all the hard work that you've done to compile these um, these books on his essays, which I'm very excited because I have to admit, I mostly know E.B. White for the children's stuff, so I'm excited yeah. to kind of dig into his essays. Yeah, um, yeah. So, and, and Cora even commented, she's like, I did not realize the breadth of his work. So I think we often forget how he really started as um, an essay writer. So it's, it's wonderful yeah. to be able to yeah. go back to that. I mean, if you want to read an essay that, that will tell you really how timeless his writing is, you know, read um, uh, Once More to New York, or Once More to New York, I'm, I'm getting the title wrong now. Uh, there, there's, there's a... Uh, a line in the end of the essay, I want to say once more to New York, I feel like I'm saying it wrong. Uh, anyway, uh, that is all about 9-11 and the, you know, the, the, the scary possibility of something like 9-11. And it's right there, in, right here, here is New York. That's, that's the title, sorry. Here is New York. Uh, it, it's, it's right there and it's just spooky when you read it. You know, it, it, it's almost like, uh, he knew that that was possible and, you know, could happen uh, in, in Manhattan. And so, and, uh, you know, some of the essays in the democracy book are the same way you read them and you go, oh my God, <laughs> you know, here we go again. Um, so, you know, definitely worth, worth rereading, but enjoy. And, and, yeah. and Melissa Sweet's, uh, the children's biography, some writer is, is, worth an adult look too. It's, it's really uh, aimed at kind of middle schoolers, but there's some great stuff in it. Uh, so oh, it has beautiful Another artwork as well. Yeah. yeah, beautiful artwork, yeah. She was living in Rockport when she was working on that. She was a neighbor. Uh, and so we, we had a lot of fun uh, collaborating on, on some of the things that could go into it. And she did just a gorgeous job. She's, she's some writer herself and certainly some illustrator. I, I would say I did read that one. We, we had her earlier 
in the month and she did a presentation at the um a virtual presentation at the library and yeah yes, yeah she yeah. she she's fantastic and i do suggest reading that one even if yeah. you're an adult you, there's nothing saying you can't read anything that's written for a child i mean they're all wonderful you can take anything out of it but um but I will let you get back to your, your evening. But then thanks again for. Um, all right. Thank you for doing this and enjoy. <laughs>